Well, here we are. Out here at the sawmill today, folks. Saturday morning, can't go wrong. Aside from the fact that it's nearly mid-May, the snow is still falling. I've got a toque on and I've got long johns on. But besides that, it's nice out. What I'm gonna do today is take you through a few of the issues that I've read on many of the Facebook forums that I follow and maybe help some of you guys overcome those problems with some of the experiences that I've gained while using my Woodland Mills HM130 portable sawmill. Now, I by no means am you know, an expert in the least, but I have had some experiences and I think some of these experiences will help you guys overcome those small little hiccups you probably have encountered ever since buying your Woodland Mills sawmill. Especially if you're new to Woodland Mills and their sawmills, you probably will have these issues at some point or another. And so just learning about what I've done to fix these issues or overcome them might be of value to you. Anyways, we're gonna head in under the shelter there. The wind's picking up. It's probably about to snow again. And uh, let's go see what we can smooth out for you guys in terms of usability of your sawmill. Well, there it is. That's my HM130. I hope you guys have seen my other videos dealing with this thing. This thing's had a few miles put on it. It's turned out to be a really good buy, a really good value, and I think a really good tool for all the things that I do around here. Judging by the pile that's out there, you can tell I cut some wood from time to time. I still have some left over here, some logs rather, and I've got some lumber over there from some recent cutting. Anyways, back to the mill. On Facebook, I like to follow some of the forums that probably some of you belong to or some of you follow, and some of those forums have common issues, and they tend to go like this. People buy a woodland mill sawmill from the website, they get it dropped off at their door, they start assembling it, they go to make their first cut, start the, start the machine up, and all of a sudden the blade flies right off. Then they complain that the machine is not assembled correctly or there's some sort of manufacturer defect and all the all the rest of it and to be honest maybe there is in some situations but i can tell you i'd imagine 99 percent of the time it is user error this machine is going to require you to align the band wheels in order for the blade to track correctly now in order to do that you're not going to be born with the knowledge of knowing exactly what to do so you have to read the manual and i'm being honest here if you read the manual it is quite detailed and it will take you through all the steps you need to do in order to ensure both band wheels your drive band wheel on this side and your follower or i think they call it an idler idler band wheel on this side correct me if i'm wrong but you have to get those two band wheels in perfect alignment they give you specific detail and direction in the manual on how to do that how to get this set up make sure you follow that now assuming that you followed the detailed guide and the manual and you got the blade set up and you think you're ready to fire it up i like to do one thing before i fire it up what i do is i basically make sure that the blade is flush with the back of this cast iron band wheel so i take my hand obviously without a glove on but it's cold today so i take my hand and i rub it right along the back of the band wheel usually in this location and usually up in this location and i want to make sure i feel flushness between the blade and the cast iron band wheel if that's flush then i come over to the other side and i do the same thing i check to make sure it's flush assuming that it's flush and assuming that i've got the correct torque spec on this bandsaw blade what i do next is I stand behind this, sort of a protective measure. I wear a glove and a long sleeve shirt, and I rotate the band wheel. Now I'm gonna rotate the band wheel in just a minute for one reason. I wanna guarantee with my own eyes that that band wheel is not moving back and forth on those band wheels as I spin the wheel. If that band wheel starts to move forward, excuse me, if that band blade starts to move forward or back, I can catch it and stop before it flies off, before the blade flies off the cast iron band wheel. I do this before I start the machine because if the blade flies off now, well, it's probably not going to be completely damaged and garbage. But I can tell you, when you get that engine fired up, you hit the throttle and the, this uh, bandsaw blade flies off, you're definitely going to be doing some damage. If nothing else, you'll be dulling parts of it. And this is exactly what I do to rotate it. I stand behind this, as I mentioned, and I just slowly rotate it. And to be safe, you can take the distributor cap off the engine, off the spark plug. But I just rotate it 
and I'm looking right here. My eyes are looking right where that blade is and I'm making sure that I don't see that blade moving forward or backwards. I want it to stay exactly where it is, flush with the back of the band wheel. And so I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna watch this side and I'm also gonna watch the exact same thing on the other side. I don't want to see that distance between the tip of the tooth and the band wheel. I don't want to see that changing because that would indicate the blade is moving forward or backwards. If it starts to move backwards or forwards and I keep rotating it, well, it's going to fly off. The blade will fly off. I don't want that to happen, obviously. So that's the first thing I do. Once I'm confident that I can rotate it several times and that blade is not moving, I know I'm in good shape to start the engine and start cutting. Now, if that blade does start to wander on me, if it starts to, as I'm hand cranking it, if it starts to move forward or back, I stop immediately. What I have to do at this point is come back over here, and this is all written in the manual. You take tension off the blade, so you make one full revolution here with the tensioner arm. And then you go back and you have to make adjustments. The adjustments that I tend to make 99% of the time are on this side of the sawmill. It tells you in the manual, this screw, and don't laugh at my uh, holy gloves here, but this screw is what you're gonna use to adjust to make the band wheel move this way or that way, right? So it's gonna move the band wheel, which subsequently will cause the blade to either move forward more or backwards more. What I do just to make my life easier, you guys can see it here, I wrote with a marker, rotating this bolt clockwise moves the blade rearward. So I'll make slight adjustments to this bolt. I'll usually probably a quarter turn each time. So if I want the blade to move backwards, I'm going to move this bolt one quarter turn clockwise and then vice versa. So what I would do Depending on the way that this blade is starting to wander, I would adjust that adjustment bolt. Then retension it. Back to 25 foot pounds, according to that right there. I'm gonna use the torque wrench. I'm not gonna guess. I'm not gonna make it 20 foot pounds. I'm not gonna make it 30. I'm not gonna go by the wind. I'm not gonna go by my gut feeling. I'm gonna go by my torque wrench. Okay, that's important. Torque this to the spec, according to your sawmill. As I said a moment ago, 99, probably 99.5% of the time, when the blade is not tracking exactly where I want it to go, so maybe it's drifting forward or drifting backwards, I more than likely have to adjust this band wheel. There is the odd occasion though, that that band wheel requires adjustment. I would say I've probably only adjusted that thing probably twice in all the years I've owned this mill, and all the times I've used it. Therefore, when you're making adjustments, try to make adjustments with this first, see if that corrects the issue. If it doesn't, then you may be looking at this side, and this side the adjustments are on the back. Right here, okay? Now, notice how I don't have anything written here, and there's actually quite a bit of dust. That's because I don't actually touch this very often, because it doesn't need it. But if it does, check out the manual. The manual has some really good troubleshooting tips, and it also has some good, uh, some good procedures in there for what to do if you have to move that side. Okay, that's it. Bandsaw blade is adjusted. It's going to track perfectly when you rotate by hand. Therefore, what I would do next is move on, shut the gates, obviously, shut the uh, doors, fire up the mill, and get to cutting. Now... You may be saying to yourself, gee, I got this thing aligned perfectly. I rotate it by hand, just like you're saying. And it, it works perfectly until I fire up the engine and then it jumps off the band wheels. Well, there might be an issue here that you may be overlooking. And what it is, is this belt here. So see this belt, I think it's polyurethane or something. It's orange in color. This belt is designed to allow the blade to not ride on the cast iron wheel, the band wheel. It holds the blade off of that band wheel just a little bit. Notice up there, you can see what I'm talking about. There's a gap between the steel, the cast iron band wheel, and the blade. If this wears down too much and that blade starts to actually ride on the cast steel, cast iron there, 
you're going to have the blade potentially slipping, right? You get some slipping, it slips the wrong direction at the wrong time, well, the blade will probably come off. Same thing holds true over here. On this side, this would be my drive band wheel, cast iron once again. You'll see the belt here, mine's probably due for a change. But this belt holds the blade slightly off the cast iron band wheel. In fact, mine is almost to the point where it can be changed because the band wheel uh, and the actual blade are almost in contact with each other. And we don't want that. We don't want that contact metal on metal will cause some slippage and the potential for the blade to fly off. Now, another point about the blade, because let's be honest, the blade is probably the number one thing you have to be concerned with when cutting with a sawmill, because if it doesn't stay on, well, you're not cutting anything. Check the bearings on the band wheels. Right here, there's bearings underneath here. If you can grab this band wheel, and if it rocks on you like this, like if you can feel movement in there as you grab a hold of the band wheel and, and rock it, if you can feel movement right there in the center, that bearing is probably shot and will need replacement. Same thing on this side, grab onto the outside edge, give it a shake. If you feel movement there, you can grab onto both sides at the same time. If you feel movement, you probably need the bearing replaced. That would be one of the other issues that potentially could cause your bandsaw to not perform and ultimately the blade to fly off. Now, from some of the things I've read online, some of you folks out there are having trouble with your blade, not necessarily flying off, but making a good dimensional cut, making it so it's cutting wood without diving or rising up. Some of the issues that could be causing this diving or rising up of your blade come from how old your blade is and whether it's sharp or whether it's getting dull. If it's getting dull, that's a potential issue that could cause that diving. Another thing that could cause that diving is the actual hook or the set on your teeth. Now, if you look at these teeth here, you're probably not going to be able to see because it's very subtle, but some of the teeth are actually hooking to the right. Some are hooking to the left. Now, it's not very noticeable from the from the, um, the far distance, but if you get in there and have a real good look at your blade, you're going to notice that some of the teeth, as I said, hook right, some hook left, and some don't hook at all and is perfectly straight. If you've used your blade for a long time, sometimes what can happen, you can hit a knot or you could hit some real dense piece in your log and it can cause that hook to actually change a little bit, get a little bit out of alignment. If it gets out of alignment, it could potentially cause your blade to drift a little bit out of what it should. Double check that. Down here, on the back side of your blade guides, and you got two of them here, mine are a little dusty, but on the back of your blade guides, there's actually a bearing that the blade rides against. Now, I don't have any distance, at least not any I can show you, from the back of my blade to that bearing, it's very minimal. Sometimes what can happen is you can be putting a excess force on that bearing. So you could actually have this too far forward. And what it's doing is it's pushing your blade out as it rotates around the band wheels. That slight rotation, uh, excuse me, that slight push could actually cause the blade to twist a little bit, twist down or twist up and as a result, give you wavy cuts. Alternatively, if you're pushing the saw too fast for the blade, what can happen is if the bearing is not right next to the back of the blade, the blade will actually flex backwards a little bit. It'll get pushed backwards a little bit because you're pushing the saw so fast, and that can cause the deflection of the blade upwards or downwards. So <clears throat> with all that said, there is some specific instructions within your owner's manual, which will talk about how close that bearing at the back of your blade guide has to be to the back of your blade. Read that and make sure it's set correctly. Don't push this thing too hard. If you're cutting some hard maple or something really solid like ash, slow down a bit, especially if your blade has had a few miles on it. That means it's probably not perfectly sharp. It's probably sharp enough but it's probably not as sharp as the day you got it. And so if you're cutting really dense material, you gotta slow down. If you don't, you're probably gonna have some rising and, and uh, dipping of your blade while you're making cuts. Now, some of the people out there who've had some diving and some rising up of their blade going through material, going through wood, have associated it with the type of lubrication they're using. 
In my experience, I have not seen any noticeable difference using lubrication versus not using it. Now that's probably because I've typically cut in colder temperatures and so that lubrication isn't necessarily needed as much because the blade is already staying relatively cool. However, some of you out there and some of the things I've read other people experiencing have said that if you don't use enough lubrication, there is potential the blade heats up to the point where it deflects and causes that wavy cutting. I can't attest to that because I haven't experienced it. And to be honest with you, in the middle of winter, I don't use any lubrication at all. Now, there's one other thing I have not talked about, and it is probably one of the leading causes of a poorly dimensioned board when you cut it. And what that is, is this bed down here, the log bed. This one right here is right on the ground. Many of you probably have yours on the ground and maybe some of you have it on a concrete pad all the better but you got to double check from time to time to make sure this thing is flat now i said flat and not level you can get away with having an unlevel log bed but as if it's out of flat meaning this one to this one to this one if they're not all in the same plane well you're gonna have issues you're gonna have some tapering of your boards you might end up having some wavy uh wavy cuts and it won't work so you got to get this log bed flat i like to use a string line in order to make my log bed flat and i'll put the uh, put the link to that video showing you how to do that down below the other thing you have to do not only make it flat length to length but you also need to make it flat side to side now this is where having it level comes into play now, when I talk about length to length flatness, I also have to talk about side to side flatness. You got to make sure that whatever plane this particular bunk is at, that the next one, the next one, and so on is also at that same level, at that same plane. I know that sounds kind of complicated, and so most people just say, make it, make it level. And that's what I normally do. Make one level, make the next level, etc., etc. If you can guarantee that you've got a flat surface that is level, you're going to eliminate a lot of that tapering of your boards. And I know many of you will say, yeah, I, uh, I leveled this thing uh, six months ago when I bought the mill and uh, all of a sudden it's not working right. Must be the machine. Well, no, it's probably your bed has come out of level or flat. And as a result, your boards are starting to get tapered. So check that. Double check. It's easy. Run a string line. Put a string level on that string line. That'll tell you length to length levelness. Then you can also get a shorter level and do side to side. It's got to be level and or flat. Now, if you guys are looking for an easy way to tell whether your sawmill, especially the bed, is flat and or level, just rock your machine. So obviously, obviously with the door shut, get it there. Obviously with the door shut, you can take your machine and rock it. Grab onto the handle, give it a few shakes. These wheels here, you see all four of them here? They have to be in contact with those rails on your bed at all times. If you rock the machine and you can feel the wheel coming up and down a little bit, that's going to tell you that it is definitely not flat or level and you have to make some adjustments. Give that a try. Give it a rock. Having one more look down here at the actual blade guide, there's an important piece you have to make sure to pay attention to in order to ensure your blade is properly tracking. What that is, is the blade guide block. See this black piece right here? There's a block, blade guide block, and there's one on the bottom. Same thing with on this side, one here and one on the bottom. It's important to make sure that that is the proper height above the blade and the one underneath is the proper distance from the bottom of the blade. In order to do that, you can take an Allen key right where my index finger is, place the Allen key in there, loosen off those blocks, and then I like to take something like a piece of cardstock and I sandwich it in there. And I can't do that too well with one hand, but I sandwich it in there between the top of the blade and the bottom side of that block. That gives you about half a millimeter of distance, approximately, you know, that's uh, up for debate depending on how thick your cardstock is, but it gives me a little bit of a distance between the blade and that block. I don't want the block rubbing all the time on the blade, but I do want it close enough so that if the blade starts to deflect, meaning it starts to twist, it will actually get caught or it'll get uh, into contact with the block and prevent it from twisting too much. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, the back of the blade also has to be in close proximity to the bearing, which is found riding very close to the back of the blade. That distance is listed in your manual as well. So it's important to check that. Those things will make it so your blade can't deflect too far because if this blade is free to go wherever it wants, if you hit something like a knot or really dense section in a log, that blade is gonna wanna twist downwards, upwards, do all kinds of things and ultimately give you a wavy cut. All right guys, last thing I'm gonna talk about here today is the dreaded ting sound. What I'm talking about, when you get your engine fired up in your sawmill, it should sound like any normal small engine. It should be just idling nicely. There shouldn't be any fancy tinging sound. Sometimes that tinging sound, it sounds like a, a loose spring or something. It sounds like there's some sort of spring or piece of metal that's sort of flopping around a little bit. What that sound is, is actually coming from in here. Inside here is the actual clutch mechanism that the engine turns that ultimately drives your sawmill. If the idle is set too high from the factory on your engine, you will hear a tinging sound when there's no throttle being applied. That tinging sound might be constant or it might be intermittent. Either way, every time you hear that tinging sound, that is the beginning of that clutch starting to engage. If that goes on for too long, you will prematurely wear out your clutch. It happened to me, that's how I know. Here's my old clutch, right there. Here's what happens and here's what a used clutch looks like. You guys see there? There's none of that grippy material actually on the on the piece here anymore. It's because it all got worn away prematurely. So, listen, try to figure out, is there a tingy sound going on? If you hear it, if it sounds like there's a loose spring or some, some sort of loose metal flapping around, well, turn the idle adjustment screw down. I'll just show you exactly where that is here. The idle adjustment screw, see if I can bring you guys to it here. See if I can remember where it is. There it is. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see right in there. Look off the top of my index finger there. There's a little screw. Mine's a black plastic one. If you were to turn that to the left, so loosen it off a little bit, that'll bring the idle down. And you'll know you went too far when your engine stalls. Now, if you can bring it all the way down to the point where the tinging sound goes away, that's exactly the sweet spot. That's where you want to leave it at. As always, I am not associated with Woodland Mills in the least. I have one of their products here, and that product has been a great uh, great addition to my, my set of tools I own. But if you have an actual technical issue, although this video gives you some insight into what you might be looking at and what you can do to maybe fix it yourself, the best choice is always to contact the tech support staff. They, uh, they know it all. They, uh, you know, they sell the product, right? So they probably have had the same question you've had million times over get in touch with them and uh, hopefully you'll get your problem resolved anyways that's going to do it for me here today i'm going to take out the old girl here for a little rip with all this uh, self-isolation going on believe it or not i put more miles on that golf cart than i have on my actual truck itself so i'm going to go out and put a few more on here today before heading back in the house because it's not exactly a beautiful day anyways appreciate all you guys watching as always come on back next time I got more lumber to be making and uh, I want to get started on one of these other projects I got uh, brewing around up in my head. So hope you guys all come along for that. Thanks again, folks, and I'll see you next time.